Okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome, members of PAC's crew. Uh, special guest Ira Harris, new member of the CME group, director, uh, and Judd's group's members. Uh, we're going to follow up on uh, the price action from Thursday, Friday, and discuss the, uh, the implications of the uh, G7 meeting this weekend, which we can already see the S&Ps are down 37 points. Uh, Ira, Pax, welcome you guys. Hey, thanks, uh, Judd. Thank you. And, and everybody, thanks for coming here on a, a Sunday, Sunday afternoon. You know, it's, it's always a time for my family and, and for my friends, it's always a time for us to get together. But we thought that we, we, we like doing these conversations on Sundays, you know, because it's, it gives us a chance while we're preparing for the markets, it gives us a chance to, to, to bounce some ideas off of one another and, and to, to really get some insight as to what's happening. Now, that's, that's a lot of what we used to do on the trading floor. And it was a great benefit to me. I don't have a, a background in, in, um, in economics. I have a background from in my, 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 uh, uh, my degrees in philosophy and theology. So that didn't, that didn't help me much with trading. But what, what did help me was uh, learning from, from Judd. My life changed in 98 when, in August of 98, when I met Judd and Judd started to um, teach me how to trade and, and mentor me and, and would change uh, through conversations with men like Ira. You know, Ira Harris, who was, you know, a director of the exchange then and a well-known and, and well-respected trader and macro analyst all over the world. So throughout my life, throughout my life, I've done nothing but maybe earn a, a, a master's or possibly a PhD degree from listening, asking questions, and then what I didn't understand and don't understand, looking up and, and doing my own research and doing my own homework. Shit. 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 So anyway, uh, I, I thought that it would be great to have a conversation like this uh, again to to prepare for the weekend and, or to pre prepare for the week ahead, especially with all of the in incredibly important uh, uh, macro issues, economic and, and, and geopolitical and otherwise that we're facing, not just across the country, but all across the world, which is affecting everything that we're doing. Um, and how do you, when we talk, when I, when Ira starts talking about his last blog post today, you know, which I just, by the way, I just, I, I, I am here. I am here. Okay. Um, I want, you know, and, and, and then while all of us here and some of us, Ira, some of the people here are, are newer traders. Some, some have been trading quite a long time. Some are, are very wealthy. Some are on their last $500. Okay. And, um, you know, the, the questions are always going to wind up being, and I love answering them, because as you know, I'd sit and I'd listen to you guys talk for hours and ask questions as a young trader and as a young man and things that I had no idea. I didn't study. I just didn't know. You guys did, you know, the generation that came before me. And I, I, I learned how to put those, those, those thoughts and ideas into actionable trades. So there's a lot to unpack here. And with that, I'm going to just shut up and do what I used to do and let Ira and Judd and everybody else talk and ask questions. So oh, another thing, if you guys have, because everybody's muted, so if you have questions that you want to ask Ira, just go ahead and type them in the message box, okay? All right, sounds good. Well, the first thing is that we just came to a big macro level in the S&Ps. Everybody, everybody in my group, remember what that level is? We're coming right down here to the 200 day. So yep. now the question is, can this thing bounce? Well, here, all right, so let me just say that real quick. And I asked anybody remember what that level was? Remember what the first level was that I had announced that I would be covering some shorts when it reached there? No matter what time it was, you know, I don't initiate trades overnight, but I manage positions overnight. All right, nobody's typing it in there. So, 2811, thank you, John. So I had orders in at 2812 and I covered another quarter, another 25% of my shorts. So okay. thanks for reminding me, Judd. So you caught that for almost uh, 30 handles before the opening, before 8 o'clock on Friday, and then you caught the whole break plus this. All because of our conversation. For, well, all because of the, 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 price, the price action. But I don't know that I would have held 
I don't know. We have not been holding positions because these markets have been headline driven and not <laughs> and not uh, trend driven. But from our conversation with Ira on Thursday, I was looking for a short. Or no, I'm I, I'm sorry. On Wednesday, I was looking to be short. Thursday and Friday, I was looking for it, and I caught I, it. Ira, you were trying to leave us. We got it. Uh, Pax wound you up and got it all out of you in the last five minutes. We all went short. That, that is absolutely right. I was trying. I was <laughs> in to leave, but Pax, hold on one second. Hold on. Yes, I think that's more obvious. Yeah, it's, I, I was I was trying to exit because there was a whole lot of stuff that, and we just kept pouring out and pouring out, and you can see what's going on. Uh, although we don't have enough yet, because the G seven concludes through tomorrow, but it's, it's as tense, it more tense than I even thought it was going to be. To tell you the truth, uh, and, and Macron is way out over his skis. I, you know, I've been reading the media, the news and the responses, and all depends, of course, where you sit is how you see this, unfortunately. Nobody has, uh, or very few people are objective enough in their analysis. You know, If you're, if you're anti-Trump and you're pro-Macron, uh, you see this all in a good light, but Macron did some very interesting things by inviting the... Uh, the Iranian uh, leader uh, to the G7. This is, this, there are things going on here that are really, uh, really uh, pushing his buttons and they're trying to push his buttons. And I'm not sure that I would poke this bear. I, I think uh, Jerome Powell made a major mistake. And I don't think that he makes a mistake because I just don't really believe that he understands what's going on here. That, you can't poke this bear. He's going he's gonna to snap back at you, and he's got everybody trapped right now. As much as he's trapped by the elections and everybody's making a big deal about that, you know, everybody needs to play different cards and respond to him whether they like it or not, and they are responding to him. So uh, uh, we're going to see more and more. I, I still believe that before, before he departs from Europe that he's going to be uh, discussing uh, tariffs on the Europeans. Uh, and that was the initial call. You know, everything that else broke. Well, I expect him to push back against Powell, especially as I put out in the blog. I think that blog covered a lot of ground as much as I could um, in deference to this. Uh, but there's even more because now we got Mark Carney talking about the end of the dollar. I don't, Mark Carney, I don't have a lot of regard for. I liked him when he was the. Uh, governor of the Bank of Canada, but when he went to the Bank of England, I think he's been very, uh, he's too political. And uh, and he's been wrong. He's been wrong about Brexit. He's been wrong about the way the economy would react to Brexit. Uh, I guess in due time, everybody will be right. But, you know, he's been wrong for, it's been three, over three years now since the Brexit vote. And everything that he projected has pro has not proven out. So, uh, I know all the people with counterfactuals will, will come at me, but I, I'm just telling you that he hasn't. And now he's just looking for a bigger position on the world stage. He's, I think Mark Carney is angry that he wasn't chosen to be the uh, new director of the IMF. I think he wanted the position really badly. So now he'll be out there uh, banging the drums. But uh, let's go from there because uh, I think we're actually seeing the markets pretty much as we thought we'd see them. Uh, Ira, is that, I saw that Carney, I, I didn't know whether to ask you about um, Carney or, or whether that was just a crackpot kind of a thing, but I mean, that was, is that being taken seriously? Uh, he throws it out there. Don't forget it's Jackson Hole. Mm. And it's supposed to be a, an academic uh, symposium. So he throws it out there for thought and uh, yeah, it's, it's serious, but I'm going to tell you what, uh, it's really nothing that we haven't discussed in this room that I haven't discussed in the blog really uh, for quite a while. Now, are we getting to that point? Yeah, maybe. Maybe, maybe we are. Yeah. Listen, the dollar certainly has issues, and rightfully so. It, it has, but that's why gold's going up. So, you know, gold is, again, 
I, I can't bang this drum loud enough, hard enough, or long enough to tell you that the gold is going up because of the inability of central banks. And what's the headline in the FT today? Let's let me read, which will be for tomorrow's FT. Uh, what is it? Uh, where central bankers rethink everything at Jackson Hole. Oh, great. Okay. okay. Now, I actually wrote a response into this because I read all, there's 160, I don't know. But the opening, the second paragraph in this article is the developed world has experienced a regime shift in economic conditions. James Bullard, president of the St. Louis Federal Reserve, told the Financial Times, something is going on and that's causing, I think, a total rethink of central banking and all our cherished notions about what we think we're doing. Now, that just blew me away. And I actually write a response into it. I'll read the response because I can't say it better than what I did. Because when step back and think about that comment. Really, step back and think about it. Okay, so here's what I write. Bullard forgets a major thing. Central banks have built massive balance sheet positions, and now they're fearful that they've been wrong in the dependency on the models they hold so dear. And yet the useful idiots keep buying sovereign debt, pushing yields ever lower. The bursting of the global bond bubble is going to cause tremendous pain, especially for the pension funds who have been so complacent believing in the wisdom of the central banks. Hey, Ben Bernanke, it ain't rocket science, but as long as the financial media treats central bankers as all-knowing, we are heading into massive storms. Time, and then I get a little wonky in, my, uh, in the way I end off. I mentioned three people who see this stuff for so many years, but that statement from Bullard, who never ceases to amaze me, is unbelievable. And yet people are going to keep buying sovereign debt. You got to be out of your friggin' mind. The central bankers are telling you that, that, that you're also thinking about that maybe they're wrong. Wow. So talk about, talk about the hedge. Talk about, talk about gold being the hedge against the central bank losing control of of monetary policy and and not a hedge against inflation. Yeah, that, you know that's. Uh, listen, ultimately, yes, it is a hedge. But in the in the world that we live in, which is why you know we've talked about gold currencies, and people say, "Oh, you're a gold bug." Not a gold bug, but you know, you know, my flippant retort is, "Well, you're a fiat currency bug," because what? if you're going to accuse me of one thing, and I'm not a gold bug, but hell, I wish. I, I wish I never owned an ounce of gold, to tell you the truth. The world would be a beautiful place, but, and, and, uh, and lions would be laying down with lambs. But as long as we have uh, policymakers who insist that they know everything and are willing to, to roll the dice on massive positions in experimenting, you know what? Gold is, becomes a legitimate hedge. As, as uh, Jim, Jim Grant so wonderfully says, against the PhD standard. And that's what, it, in a fiat currency world, when central banks begin to lose credibility, we are in a very dangerous time, which is why, you know what, listen, you can be a trader and buy, and buy uh, bonds all over the world, but if you do it as an investor, uh, it's now what I call the, of course, the fog rod trade, because they keep stuffing these bonds down, down the throats of uh, certain types of investors, and and it's not going to end well. It can't end well. I, I'm sorry. And if and if the answer is Jay Powell's um, remark, very flip remark to me is, you know, the ECB, you don't have to worry about it because they have a printing press. That's not a reason to own sovereign debt. I'm sorry. That's just where I, where I that's just where I uh, reside in. So you know, do with it as you may. But. Uh, but you know, you know, and everybody in this room who's been here for a while and and has talked with me and and I can't say it more enough on CNBC when you have to take everybody to task because it's not an inflation. Look at bonds are going up and gold's going up. So tell me where the inflation move is. It's not. It's about the credibility. Now you could say, I read, well, bonds are going up, and that's and if they're credibility, who'd be buying bonds? Bonds are going up because you have central banks who have distorted the mechanism so dramatically that it makes it too difficult for what we used to call, and I still love the, the phrase, bond vigilantes. Um, 
and as long as the central banks are willing to control them. And how do we know that they control them? It's, it's fairly easy because what was the first bank that did this? The, the Bank of Japan. And, and there were people, great traders, great traders. I'm talking about the, the, um, um, Bruce Caxton of, of, uh, of Covenor, uh, Bruce Covenor of Caxton Partners. I'm talking about Stanley Druckenmiller. I'm talking about Paul Duder Jones, some of the great global macro traders, Paul Sor uh, George Soros, who termed, after they got so beat up trying to short uh, JGBs, the Japanese 10 years, because, well, everybody could see what the outcome was going to be, but you couldn't fight the Bank of Japan. And with the Bank of Japan, of course, were the massive Japanese pension funds who were buying bonds, but they were buying bonds for a far different reason. Because Japan was actually in a deflationary cycle, deflation. So prices were going down. So if you were a Japanese investor, it was perfectly a quality investment to buy bonds because if inflation was a negative 1%, and, and I'm talking about real terms, not talking because it may be more. So if you got 20 or 30 or 40 basis points on a 10 year, you were still getting a real yield of 150 basis points, so to speak. That's a pretty good return. And don't forget that when they, when everybody was trying to crush the Japanese, you know, when they said, well, you're, they're going to have inflation, you got to sell these bonds, their debt is, is increasing dramatically, their, their public debt. And, and you, th these are the perfect sense, except that 97% of all JGBs prior to the real ramp up by the BOJ were owned by Japanese investors. So if you were a Japanese investor, a Japanese saver, it made perfect sense on those bonds. I can't say the, thing, the same thing about European debt because there is no deflationary spiral in, in Europe. And there certainly is not a deflationary spiral in the United States. So if you're buying a 10-year note that yields 1.6%, 1.55, inflation is, let's be kind and say it's 1.5%. So it, the real yield is zero. And, and again, I say we're being kind. Um, that's nothing like Japan. And people who compare it with Japan, I think, uh, really lose the, the contextual argument because it's nothing like that. It's far different. But that's the world in which we reside in. Again, I don't fight markets, okay? I'm not a, a – the only people I know who were total contrarians, who always did well, were Board of Trade grain traders. That was – those were the greatest contrarians I knew. Uh, I'm not of that ill. So, uh, and I'm not belittling that. You know, listen, and there's, fortunes have been built on that, but that's not my nature and that's not my style. Uh, I want to know in a bigger picture what's going on. So that's what's going on. But you have to be an imbecile. And I'm not, sorry, if you fit, yes, you're making money because the, bonds, the bond uh, prices are going up. But if you buy them and hold them for any duration, I'm going to say you're an imbecile. But that's just one man's opinion. And I'm not getting short of them because, again, I can't fight the central banks. And you're right. You're right to be buying them on a trade basis because that's what the central banks are doing. And you better damn well hope that they keep doing it. All right. So, Ira, I just threw up the spoo bonds quarterly. Yeah. Um, back to 2000 so everybody can see it. And I'm pointing to uh, July 2017 and the next quarter, that first week you and Anthony and uh, were a top step trader, that's when we had a 20 year breakout in this spread. Right, from, uh, from December of 1999. Yeah, and so that gave you the 265 points or 365 or whatever it was, straight up to the 2965 target. Now, what I'm going to pull over here is the gold and euros chart on a semi-annual, and you can see that we're breaking out above a 10-year level. So if I'm looking for the same type of uh, – provided we stay above 136.31, now you know where you're wrong, right here. It's just sold high. That's where you manage risk. You know, I'm looking for a lot of people. <laughs> okay, well, that That's not me. I don't know who that is. Somebody's got a mute. 
right. sounds like a that sounds like a live feed from the G seven. <laughs> <laughs> That was wonderfully funny. That was great. A bunch of children yelling in the background. <laughs> oh, That's right. That's exactly what the G7 is. Oh, my God. That's great. Uh, 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 with Baby Huey as the headliner. <laughs> yeah, he's got a lot of help there, though. <laughs> All right. So my point here is that this can really start to go, and I've been talking about this for a couple of days, featured it in Friday night's DMI. <laughs> you, you've got to break out in the silver as well. So uh, you got to pay attention to this stuff. This, you know, because I'm showing you that when these moves start and you get a macro breakout like this, and that's why we're not looking at a five second chart. Uh, you know, some, uh, we're not, we don't get caught in indicator traps. We're not looking at a short term five minute chart. We're looking at charts that can tell us what can what the markets can really do and this right. is like, let me ask judd let me ask you a quick question about that so um and 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 i know it's it's uh uh obviously it's going to be uh a repeat over for what many of us already do know but um what is how, what is a a, a spubon spread or a nasdaq spread a spubon or NASDAQ bond or even Russell bond. And, you know, where did you and how did you and Ira decide to, you know, use it or how do you, you know, that kind of thing, just the history. That's, on, that's real, Ira's gig. Real quick. Okay. All right. Let me explain to you where it came from. Um, I was out for a run on my lunch break in like 1992. I was on the, I was running along the lake uh, and it was a, just, that's what I used to do for my lunch. I used to go for run. I used to run. Uh, so I was running along the lake and, and I, I literally, I can tell you exactly where I was. I'd been thinking about certain things and uh, the markets and, and I, I got to North Avenue beach and there was a phone there, a pay phone for those of you who don't know what that is. It used to be, <laughs> so I picked up the pay phone and I called uh, Howard and I said, you know, I'm out, I'm on this run, and I'm thinking, the way we treat the S and P's, it's like they can exist in the in the ether world, untethered and have no. I said, I don't believe that. They have to be tied to something. I said, and the greatest thing that moves them is interest rates. So I said, you know what? Let's look at the S and P versus the thirty year bond, just to get a sense of. of uh, of where the market is relative to one of the most important uh, instruments, um, uh, debt instruments in the world. And let's see if we, f we find anything. Well, Howard dug deep and he, co and he couldn't believe the, re the pattern and the relationships that we, we saw develop. And that's, that's when we started looking at it. And he back tested it and he looked at it. And it was Everybody needs to mute out. Gotta get said, right now, the day history is repeating itself. And I said, in years to come, There's I said that long. community is going to gather and talk about how much they had. And they didn't do a fucking thing. All right. Ira, now you're going to have to unmute. Wait a again. second. I'm going to unmute. Ira, I, I don't know why that person, these people can't. Oh, uh, that was funny. It's going to be another funny. honey, you suck in bed. Hey, there he is. There he is. Hang on a second. I got to find Ira. I muted him. Find Ira and then also um, Peter. Hold on. I found myself. Here I am. Unless it, unless it was <clears throat> Peter. Hold on. Ira, I'm looking for you. You're at the bottom of the list now. I got to find you. There you are. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. That's all right. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. So that was really the advent of that is that, you know, I had said it and, and when in looking at it, we found that there was a real relationship. I can't tell you more than that. It's actually pretty simplistic, but when you see the moves that it's caught highs and lows, it is phenomenal. And I don't know why. I don't, I don't know why, you know, it was right. just one, one of those things I was thinking about and, you know, upon, analysis we found that there was a relationship so we, we used the futures 
you can use whatever you want. It's worked for me. Uh, as Judd points out, going back to October, that was another time that it really carried its weight because we got a substantial move out of that uh, straight straight up. Uh, it was so fast. And then I said, you know, it's just time to sell it because it was just parabolic. It went parabolic for months. So uh, we use that's it all, all the there is to it. Let me ask you, so just real quick, one, one last question. So I, obviously I knew that story, but I, 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 what I've never asked is, um, and I knew that Howard ha had done some work, but how far back did, did Howard go in order to determine that, yes, this had validity? I can't tell you that. I don't know that. Okay. It's his proprietary work. We just discussed Got it. Got it. Got it. Nothing more. And Howard was a CQG user, so I'm assuming he probably at least went back to 1982. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know, but you know what? Uh, then, whether, you know, yeah, whether I, he did. I think, I think he was amazed at, at, at what it showed. I really do. I think he was, uh, well, you know, uh, and said, well, you're, in, you're onto something. But, it, you know, Howard and I had a lot of those eureka moments because I would do some thinking about things and, and he always respected my, my uh, view when it came to that stuff. So, uh, so, and then he would, you know, and then if he's doing it, then when he would do the work, if he would uh, verify it, he would, you know, he go off. Well, it's, you know, sometimes, or he would test it and go, no, there's nothing here. You're, you're wasting my time and your time. And I certainly respected that. So that's, that's really it in a nutshell. Nothing more than that. And it's great because it works on, Ira looks at it on, a, on a, like a 240 minute time frame on out. I look at it on the daily stuff and you have to know how to manipulate the spread bars to see the data properly. Because if you don't manipulate the, the spread bars properly and how much data is coming in, you won't see the right chart. That much I know and I spend a lot of time with the head guy at CQG going over the inputs to, to make sure I'm looking at the right chart. So I wouldn't trust it on a Bloomberg terminal. I wouldn't, because they're going to be line charts. I, I, this is the only place I, I trust the data inputs because I can manipulate them. So. And, and that's it. I, I can't tell you, you know, so you can find fault with it. Great. It's a, you know, so a lot of times I, I feel that when you simplify things, uh, it works out far better. Uh, then you can dig deeper if you want. And, you know, we, we, we've, We've done some cross correlations with uh, using the Bund uh, DAX, uh, you know, so there, there's been uh, all types of uh, uh, back and forths on it. So uh, that's, you know, that, that's really, and, and it's nothing proprietary, you know, I'm just telling you what I, what I you know, how simple it was. And yet it, that what really proved its worth was of course the high that was made at 1631.32 in December of 1999. And think about how critical that that caught that. I don't know why it caught it, but it really, it, it really proved itself many times. And then we would see numbers off there, whether they were Fibonacci stuff and uh, numbers or, you know, especially highs and lows and Judd will attest to it because, you know, he would remind me, he says, have you looked at it? I, oh, you know, I got to go back. I haven't taken a look at it. And, uh, and we did, you know, so. Uh, yeah, that's, we always use them for, it's a confirmation tool. It's yeah. a big confirmation tool. Right, right. That's right. It, and when it, when it confirms, it's, it's really powerful. You know, sometimes you don't, get, you don't get the breakdown. You think, oh, you know, it's not confirming on the spread. So you don't want to take it and, uh, like a short. And, and you've seen that through the entire rally. And then yeah. when it started giving you the confirmations that it was breaking down on the weeklies, then you didn't want to be long anymore. Yeah, you know, it's, that's right. Yeah, that's right. It's, and, and you know what, when you're looking for an exit strategy, that's not, it's not a bad one to utilize that way. And now we know on the bigger picture, which we're going to get a test of, of that 200 month moving average, which as judges pointed out, was that 1631 area 
which has been such a valid technical area on this whole thing. So, uh, and we're going to get a test of it. I, I have no doubt about. I, unless you know, they, because again, if we look at Friday's action, prior to, uh, uh, to Trump um, and his effort, the the, the retaliation. Yeah, well, well, his attack on Powell uh, prior to that, uh, the market, as we know, actually wanted to rally even after China, because we know what the market the market was up early. China comes out with the with the tariffs announcement from their from their aspect, and then uh, at, right after Powell speaks, the market actually goes higher again. So it took you know, and then. Trump crushed it when he started going after Powell in a very aggressive way. So that's what the market market took away, and and that's that was it. Yeah, and the spreads. And if you look back at the spreads, the spreads <coughs> topped in October on the monthly, and. All we got on the weekly was a week retest, and then the week, uh, the 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 first week in in uh, August, outside of versus the lower week, you had a big break. It tried to come back up and and do some work back up towards this gap, and it 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 couldn't even get close as, in in futures terms. It couldn't get, a, get above the mid forties in the S and P's. And that's, you know, what, you know, I look at is to see if it's actually, if it can actually do something. You know, we needed uh, uh, at least above 50 and better above 65 to think that this could hold and sustain. And it, it never even got back to the 50 day. So now we're at the 200 day. And you know Matt just took some money here, as 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 you should. Well, I and look, Judd. Everybody knows. Everybody in my room, and you do too, because you're still my mentor after all these years later. Um, that when after Fed Day, when we had came back down and tested these levels, we were on a group mentoring call, and I was talking about I was trying to teach everybody how to manage positions. And I was talking about the targets and where I was going to cover. Meanwhile, I'm watching them as we're talking about them. I'm literally watching the market trade down to 28.11, 28.10, you know, that whole 10 to 12 area where I was planning on covering some. And then I was watching it come back down to the 200 day and below to our target, to our macro level. And of course, watching it come. <laughs> I, didn't put my, I didn't put my order in, you know, I'm while I'm teaching and talking about how to execute, I just simply did not execute. Um, so I am not going to make that same mistake twice. We came down to the macro level and I covered, not all, I took some profit down there uh, on a on 25% of, of my, my position. And once we get down to not the 200 day, but the next macro level, which is a little bit further than that, I'll be covering there a little bit more. Well, I'll, I'll cover more than half my position there for now. But that truly goes back to our discussion, uh, you know. And, and at the end of it, I still, I poured, I, I talk, I, I poured all over um, uh, the news. Well, not all over, but I, I you know, for me, <laughs> I poured all over the news this weekend. Um, there's, there's two things, two points I wanted to bring up in, in regards to, to, uh, there, the, you know, there is absolutely a discussion. Uh, that is ongoing out there about President Trump starting the next the next thing would be to con continue to to raise rates on China up to maybe fifty percent. But also discussing and this is what we talked about the other day discuss uh, uh, threatening uh, fresh tariffs on 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 Europe. Oh yeah, they're co I, I I believe you know I I've, I've been adamant about that and I believe that they they're absolutely going to take place because. The Europeans have done nothing, you know, especially Macron. Macron is grandstanding here, you know. Again, you you want to call, you want to challenge? Fine, let's let's have that discussion. But he's 
he's grandstanding and it ain't it's it's not playing well with uh with the Donald. Uh you know, you're talking about somebody who who feels slights every which way. And and, uh, yeah. and, and, and they're playing and, and you know and and uh and Donald keeps raising issues. He you know, he raises his, the issue of Russia back into the G eight. Okay. You know what? That's near and dear to him, but these guys are playing with him. And the fact that, he, you know, now the French said that they told Trump ahead of time that the Iranian president was coming. Um, don't know whether whether or not they did. But I, I, tomorrow is a press conference from the G7. This should get interesting because, again, Trump is in a fiery mood. The White House keeps sending out these things. This morning, it looked like there was some um, walk back, you know, from China, you know, with it, somebody asked the question, did Trump, you know, feel, and and it was reported by the media that, you know, maybe he was suffering a little remorse about, and then the White House comes out and says, no, what he meant was that he wished he would have put on, made him, made him t tougher and strong and higher. So, I mean, this is... I, it's really hard. You have to be on your toes. So when you say you're reading, you have to read everything. You have to, because you have to discern what is what appears to be pure nonsense. Now, I, I hope, and and many others hope, that Trump would walk back some of this, and that they would actually come to some type of real agreement. You know, maybe Xi will show up next. You know, and maybe okay. You know, maybe we can do, but that ain't going to happen because. You know, as as you as somebody in this room, I think it was uh, Pete who talked about the guns of August. Was that right? Was it Pete? Who was it on Friday? Yeah, Peter. Did. Was that, that was Brian brought that up, but it kind oh, of Brian, I'm, I'm sorry. The point quite well, yeah. Yeah, right. You know that once these things are in motion, you got to be very and and again, Cudlow's out. But what is he? Th <laughs> where is he at with his comments today about China? Well, we, he doesn't think this will escalate. You've been wrong every step of the way. <laughs> Everything you say proves to be wrong because Trump undoes whatever you think is going on. And then you have, you know, wow. It, it, there's, I don't know whether it's in disarray by, uh, by design, because that could very well be possible. It could very well be possible that it's all by design to be, you know, to appear this way. Uh, now, you, somebody would say, well, you're giving them too much credit. You know what? This is an apolitical issue. I, I don't, when, when I do this analysis, I, as, you, as you in this room know as well as anybody, and anybody who's read my blog for the 10 years I've been writing, my politics, if, if you know my politics, I've made a huge mistake because you're, my politics should not enter into it. We, we analyze things in what we try to be the most objective way possible. Now that doesn't mean that I can't call Trump a buffoon for doing things, but that doesn't mean that's what I think, that I think everything he does. No, I think some of the things he's been right on, he just doesn't communicate them very well. He, he's certainly right on dealing with China, not in the way that he does it, but in the big picture. He's been right on some other things too. Uh, I. What I vehemently disagreed with is tax relief, although I was in favor of corporate tax relief and a middle class tax cut, but that tax plan got some corporate tax relief, but nothing for the middle class. So I thought that was very faulty. Um, and there, but when he's right, you, you have to say that he's right. And when he's wrong, I'll call him out for it because I'm not married to anybody. Just the same I felt about Obama, the same I felt about uh, when did I say? Oh, Bush was already gone. So I've only had, uh, uh, I've had Obama and uh, and Trump. But these are things that are very, very important. And and the politics, to me, no, we're we're here to 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 seek out uh, potential profits. That's all. That's all. You know, as I say, the rest is gibberish. You want to go, you know, turn this into CNN or MSNBC or Fox. Please, you know, don't waste the time. You're not here to prove their point. We're here to discuss things as they relate to the ability 
to to make um, potential profits in what I and others deem to be the global macro world. Uh, your, your time scale is your time scale, not mine. Uh, the things that I try to, to put forward are always difficult to time and may and you know if you if you have bad timing you're going to lose money, but things to think about and listen nothing says it better than than Thursday's discussion because it led to people to be aware of what could possibly take place and the potential was there to make significant profits and, and you know what. I, again, if you sat and listened to the, to the talking heads on television, you never would have gotten this because it does, it's not what sells. And don't forget, they're selling bull markets. They're selling bull markets. And they're selling belief in every facet of the narrative. They, they, they provide the backdrop for that narrative. Me, I don't accept anybody's narrative. And I owe Ben Hunt from uh, Epsilon a, a lot of credit. I, he really changed even after all my years, but him and I've had some discussions and his work on narratives has been exemplary. I don't accept anybody's narrative. And that's exactly uh, what who was that, Matt? Was that you, Matt, talking about you were digging through everything today? Or yeah. is that uh, when you're digging through everything, that's what you're trying to discern and trying to get yourself away from is accepting the narrative. I don't accept the narrative. I have to dig and find it and go, well, if that makes sense, fine but I'm not buying anybody's narrative. And you could see the faces on CNBC. They were so caught off guard by Friday. They, they, their, their faces were chalk white and Santelli wasn't there. He, was, he told me he wasn't going to be there Friday. He had a long planned day off, but they were all caught off guard. But that's because they, they accepted the, 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 uh, with, with a predisposition, the narrative, the narrative coming from, from Jackson Hole. Well, I think I think Powell made a gigantic mistake by even giving that speech. And I said that before he gave the speech because nothing good was going to come come of it. And Trump was wrong when he said, "Well, Fed policy coming out of Jackson Hole." There was no policy coming out of Jackson Hole. It was never intended to be a policy. Uh, unfortunately, Bernanke had opened up that window, and Draghi and others followed it, and he did set policy from there. But Powell made a mistake. He never should have given that speech. Nothing good was going to come out of it. And he should have just proceeded. But again, who did they drag out? We heard from Esther George. We heard from Rosengren. You know, they were busy dragging these people out. Like, I was surprised. I was supposed to be surprised that Esther George was hawkish. Well, she voted against the rate cut at, on July 31st. There was no surprise there. She, and I give her a lot of credit because she stays the course. Rosengren, you know, the same way. So there were no surprises. And, and it left Powell in a dangerous position because he had to walk back their hawkishness. And he tried to, but he wasn't going to go that far. And then he wound up, you know, as I talked about in the blog today, and, and I, we talked about on Friday. And we talked about on Thursday before it happened that Trump was not going to deal with this in a very good way. And it's exactly what happened. So, so uh, Ira, there's, uh, you know, the guns of August moment kind of uh, feeling that we had it on the end of the day on Friday that uh, I, I can see like two different things happening, that there's a, uh, a collision with China with the U.S. and then there's a collision in the Euro. <laughs> U and, yeah. and the sides, you know, the, the, the the Macron is a week you know, way weaker than he acts and yeah. the bureaucrats who run the EU they can't concede to Britain's any sovereignty or anybody else and Britain's demanding its sovereignty and and they're not going to back off so that's a collision that looks like certain to happen with a lot of geopolitical financial consequences and then over in uh, with China you can uh, you know you can argue that they might be making a mistake thinking they can make Trump back off. The U.S. political system is weak. Uh, and, uh, and and Trump, I don't think, maybe appreciates that the the Communist Party of China <laughs> cannot show weakness at this point. They, they're, they can't concede to Trump. Uh, she, if she did so, his own people would probably kill him. And uh, But also that they believe that they're on course to become the greatest nation on earth. And they're not, and they're, they're not going to be turned back from that. So, well, 
Well, I, you know, I, I don't think I don't know how much they can concede. So uh, well, I I would you know I I I don't go there because we're making presuppositions that I'm not sure. And and why go that deep? The Chinese are trying to be the Chinese, um, and trying to to yes to raise their stature in the world. But listen, you know if you read Chinese history, and I have read quite a bit of Chinese history, you know the their anti-colonialist stance weighs significantly on that on a lot of their decision making, and and that's what the West fails. It's like the West would like to wipe wipe away its colonialist past. Well, you know what? It's in the words of uh, Chalmers Johnson, and I hate to throw out these names, but I, I give credit. I only throw them out to give credit. You, they talk about blowback, and there is blowback from past policies. There's a lot of blowback. Yeah, uh, but you know, Ch and, the Chinese also have a, a feeling of a, a racial and national. I mean, that his, their whole history is thousands of years. All, all this stuff is embedded embedded in their own internal. Uh, you know how they view themselves. Well, yeah, yes, you know, there's, there's no question. Listen, we are every, every empire in China was an empire. Every, every empire in its, in some capacity, felt itself to be um, uh, the manifestation of a divine blessing. Uh, you know, I don't care whether it's Spain, and I don't care whether it's certainly France. I'm sorry. All you do is have to go to Versailles. Uh, uh, whether Britain, you know, uh, you know, in the United States with its manifest destiny, every, you know, so I'm not going to hold the Chinese, you know, that's just part of. No, the, but, but I bring it up because, of history. because I, I, I'm, I'm, and I'm speculating obviously, but I'm making an argument that they really can't concede. And on Wall Street Week, uh, you know, Kyle Bass has made a, a really strong detailed uh, argument, the same argument in his talk. Uh, but the, I guess the thing I wanted to point out was, there's several markets that have multi-year levels being taken out at, you know, this weekend and we, you know, we'll see where they really trade this week, but uh, you know, gold is, gold comes to mind. Yeah. You know. And, and, uh, and what was the other one? Uh, oh, the, the yuan, the yuan, another move down. Yeah. And, uh, and that might be engineered by the Chinese themselves. I don't know. You know, we don't we, we we don't know we 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 don't know whether it's just you know money reacting you know and nervous and uh, I, I but I I really don't think the Chinese at this point want to play that card because they're looking for allies around the globe too you know everybody's you know, Trump talks very tough but he's he, he would like to have some support here which is why we may get a little more conciliatory, you know, and I wasn't sure about this morning's tweets from him uh, and what the news reported, because there might be a little concern, because everybody, it's hard to go it alone. You know, Trump likes to put that face on that they'll go it alone, but they're not going alone, because at the same time, they were blasting out that they were close to making a deal with the Japanese. So there's a lot of things moving here. So, you know, it's... So our, our friend Judd here on his, uh, his work, which he sells on his matrix, He's got some pretty big tar upside targets on gold from where we are right now. And if we break out these levels right now, I just want to throw that out. Yeah. yeah. And, and you're looking at silver copper I just threw up. Oh, yeah, my favorite. I mean, and that thing, if, if this thing's good, it's coming back here to test, retest 88.14. It's going to come back and retest the August 2016 breakdown. Yeah. <laughs> you know that that's your world. I you know I can only see it in the way, and I respect. You know, as everybody knows, I respect technicals. I don't pretend to be a technician of any standing, but uh, I know that in a it, when you're involved in trying to uh, uh, create uh, the, the the greatest amount of uh, potential gain with the least amount of loss. You better be have some sense of the technicals because otherwise you're just adrift at sea. And and here's the gold copper. I mean, it's already breaking out of that level above that 2000, 2016 area. <coughs> so now it's um, you know spent some time up here over this level to see if it's real. But you know, I my opinion is it's real, so I'm treating it as such. 
And, uh, you know, you just got to stay the course of the gold. Everybody's got huge leads on it. There's no reason to get out of it. No, you know what? It's, it's really, uh, and it is, it's, it, it, that will use words like haven. Listen, it's, it's really, it, and, and when you see a headline like the central banks, you know, and the FT coming out of Jackson Hole, it's, it's a, a, a it, wow, that headline to me, that shook me more than anything else I've read today because this is what they're coming up with and this is what they're saying after they've made these phenomenally huge bets. Really? The ECB has a, a $4 trillion uh, balance sheet. The Fed has a 3 dollars to $4 trillion balance sheet. Uh, Bank of Japan, an enormous balance sheet. Bank of England, a, an enormous balance sheet. The Swiss have been playing a game of, uh, uh, of uh, alchemy for, for quite a while now. And there are major bets. Tell me what shape you really think the world is in here. And I'm not, uh, you know, it, that's just reality. This is not supposition. And, and, and to hear Bullard make that comment, it, it really should make everybody sit up and think going, wow, these are major bets made. Uh, and now they're saying that they're not sure. I, I think that statement does more to undermine uh, and to bring Congress uh, into examining the Fed and what it's done. And, and he actually makes Trump, he elevates Trump. I, I, I just, I, it, it's, it's unconscionable to me. What, what are you thinking about? Uh, but if this is the feeling coming out of Jacksonville, then, then I, I keep coming back to the same point. And again, you guys are all going to say, uh, uh, ad nauseum, tell me what the exit strategy is. Tell me how you exit this. Tell me. Yeah, I, I just. Well, uh, there isn't one, and I, I don't see it. And I'm just going to pull out one number for everybody right now, and you ought to write it down. It's 272875. That's another 100 points lower. So that's a long way off. But in today's world, you never know. But that's when everybody in the world jumps ships on U.S. equities. All right. Do you remember? The, do you remember um, the the last time we traded that price? Do you remember the what 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 happened? To Actually, the last, the last, no, it was well. Maybe we traded it in June. The the first week of March, Judd, uh, we had we had fought, we had broken from twenty eleven down to the low was 2723 if i recall correctly and it was the first week of march i, I built up a nice position that we, yourself will you please we built up a i built a, up a, a pretty nice short position every day that week and and on that friday we opened up at 28 or 27 quarter uh the top of the opening range was 28 27 28 so i i got i started i got long out, out of there but not, not enough to cover my spirit. Not enough to cover my shorts. When we got above, um, I forget what I forget what the price was. But when we got a uh, right around the time we got above twenty seven, twenty eight, something had happened with the uh, uh, the peso and with the the railroad. I forget uh, uh, the railroad that the the, the proxy for my, southern. southern, yeah, that Ira likes, and they they had both turned up, uh, and also that you know, hey, this is a risk on. Get out of your shorts, cover. And I didn't hesitate. I got, I got, I got out of my shorts in the market. Well, that, that was it. The market never did. The market didn't look bad. We rallied 150 points from there, 200 points. Hey, one other thing, and I'm not going to stay much longer, but there was another article, and I don't know, uh, Matt, whether you picked it up this morning. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. Bundesbank Viedman opposes new stimulus. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. boy. Here we yeah. go. Okay. Now, now you know my view that it was a mistake not to make him the head of the ECB because you need a German as the head of the ECB. And uh, of course, uh, Macron. I think, that, uh, I think that statement just told us why, uh, Ira. Absolutely. That there's so much dissension that, again, don't believe the narrative because the narrative that they want to push at you is, oh, you know, Germany's going to very meekly head into. Uh, a fiscal stimulus package, and everybody's in favor, and, and the uh, 
and the ECB is a huge rate because you got another rate cut at the September meeting with more Q, QE or QQE is because they might just be buying stocks now, financial stocks. So, but, and it sounds like, you know, Wiedemann had gone away. And in fact, last week they were running with us, you know, the Bundesbank is behind fiscal stimulus. And I, and I said in my blog, when I saw that statement, I said, yeah, that's well and good. Well, let me hear what Wiedemann has to say. Yeah. Well, now we, now we know what Wiedemann has to say. He said he was particularly cautious about government bond purchases because they can blur the line. So he hasn't gone away. Don't believe the narrative that the mainstream media is selling. Because again, they're selling uh, what a lot of policymakers, because that's who they interview and that's who they talk to. They're not calling me. And they're not calling people who may see things differently. No, they go to their sources, who they have access to. And everybody there is pushing out a line. Sorry, it's just that's why I work so hard to try to to look beyond the uh, standard narrative. But he, here he was this morning saying, well, hold on, uh, you know, not so quick here. And that, of course, you know, I raised a question in today's blog, and it's a serious question that has to be uh, looked at. And we've talked about in this room, it's where the think, my thinking about this came from, from this room, <coughs> which is, is the German backstop of the ECB balance sheet a form of fiscal stimulus? Because if you think that it is, then it raises all types of questions about what people think the outcome of this is going to be. And again, everything that I'm looking at, not everything, but a lot of things that I'm looking at have to do with measuring the, import, the significance of the planned exit strategy and do they have one. And that's it. And that's where I'm going to leave you. But I think that everything that we discussed on Thursday, forget Friday, is where we sit right now. The only thing missing is Trump going after Europe. And, and if he's disillusioned enough with this G7 that he, that he starts talking about tariffs on, uh, on uh, European exports to the U.S., Ira, do you think uh, Draghi has had a conversation in the past with Angela Merkel about his strategy of a eurobond? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I I have to imagine with somebody it's taken place. Um, because I, like I said on Friday, um, you know, somebody better send the Germans a memo that that yeah. that's his plan. Well. I think that there are people in Germany who see it. Uh, if you read Wiedemann, uh, I think that they see it and they fear it because the German populace. There's an article today also. Uh, let me see if I can find it. And then I'm going. I got, I got to go. Uh, let me see. I might be able to find it. Let's see. Um, let's see where I saw it. Maybe I didn't see it. Where, uh, let's see. Let's see. But Ira, something, something that we've never actually delved into, and, and maybe we can leave it here and, and make it a conversation for another day. Yeah. So we have the idea of a euro bond, okay? Yeah. But we've never discussed um, the, what the result of that would be. Would it be a good thing? Would it be a bad thing? What the potential trades might be if that I, were to happen? I, I've thought long and hard, hard about that. And if it's done with, you know, Germany really uh, being involved in this and, and signing on to it, it will be an initial boom to Europe. That's my thought process on that. You think you get a stronger euro out of that? Yes. It would give, because then you would have a, ver a real alternative backed, backed by, uh, uh, let me see if I can find this. Um, and, and like you've said in the past, what price would Germany extract for the privilege of being the backstop? Yeah, it's, that's the penultimate question that we have to uh, and see. and I've, I've thrown this out there, and I know you said, well, that would violate the EU treaty. Mm -hmm. But Germany just comes back and says, to hell with the treaty. 
you want to use our checkbook, then we've got in Germany, as Germans, we've got to go out there and cut whatever trade deals we need to be able to cut in order to keep this checkbook full. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, because nobody's going to do something for nothing. Of course, the, the mainstream narrative will be, well, they're benefiting from a very weak uh, uh, currency. So that's that's the trade-off for them. So they have to be willing uh, to deal with it, you know, so they'll, they're, they're willing uh, to be the, the, the backstop. And, and that because, takes it to, to something you've always said. Uh, for our enemies, we enforce the rules. For our friends, we, we bend them. Yeah, that's, that's for Something my, like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for, uh, no, for, for our friends, for our, for our friends, we interpret the rules. Right, for our right. enemies, we, for our enemies, we enforce them. Oh, that's Cook County to, to, to. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not saying anything. No, you can't. But that's, uh, um, that, that's that, what that they, basically comes from the way Greece was treated. That, that's where I think I was, you know. Well, it's, it's the history of the world, you know. We, we, you know, as we always want, we want justice for the other guy and mercy for us, right? It's the way the world works. We're all guilty of it. You should understand my situation, but enforce the rules on him. He's a, you know, he's a bastard, so go ahead. We don't like so I were like we, like, like we Like we said on Friday, in, in the short run, there isn't going to be a trade deal until we walk the path of some sort of pain and both sides have to come to the table. But the depth of point A to point B, I think, is, is where the markets have grossly uh, overestimated the possibility of a trade deal because that's the narrative. You know, everybody, every analyst, strategist. So, you know, do you think we'll get a trade deal? You know, do you think uh, that, that's all the um, uh, your friends in the media ask? is, uh, you know, when are we getting a trade deal? I, I'm looking for this article. Let's see. Hold on. Let me see if I can. And nobody asks, what, what would it look like? Oh. All right. Wait. So, Matt, I just want to bring your attention to this 100 by 3, because this is a big level. And, you know, and guys have to, guys have a lot of money in trades tonight. Um, uh, don't give them all back. Yeah, that's right. Okay, but here, I'm going to give you this, and then I'm, I'm definitely going. There's a Bloomberg article. Uh, it was posted by these by my favorite guys who are the best global macro traders that I know. So, sorry, Matt, you're good, but these guys are <laughs> really good, and they know how to uh, deal with me. These are the guys that, uh, pra well, now they're Praxis Trading, because um, I was honored to give them the name that I had used. But here's the title of the article on Bloomberg. Germany in uproar. Now, this is to, this is from uh, yesterday. Germany in uproar as negative rates threaten saving obsession. Let me say. You want me to say it again? Uh, give me a second, please. Yeah. <laughs> That's the title of the article on Bloomberg. Uh, yeah, good. Ger Germany in uproar as negative rates threaten saving obsession. Yeah. Great. So you can go find it and read it. I I I really just scoured it. I have not read it. I've just been uh, overwhelmed by uh, so much, but it's worth looking at. And that's where I'm going to leave you at. And we'll pick up. A, listen, again, what's the purpose of this whole exercise that we go to? Is to be prepared for what's coming at you, not what, what did, because the charts will show you that. But we want to be prepared for what's, potentially coming down the road and i think we've done that very well the last few days so i congratulate all of you and it's uh and it's been good you 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 pushed me to my limits and i appreciate it well here let me uh, and and ira thank you but one last thought for me too that goes uh, in regards to what angelo just said and follows up with you're saying is that um what's the end what's the end game uh you know how do we get out of this uh, what what are the mom and pops that have their 401ks that think they're good it's it there is no way game. it's going to be ugly it'll be dangerous well what but it may be that equities out way outperform because to, yes. to me the sovereign debt markets are the most vulnerable because people just blindly blindly and, and you know, right now they're right they're harvesting big profits if you're a trader but if you're doing it as an investment 
You know, Leon Russell said it, said it best. Watch out now. Beware. Take care. Because it ain't going to be pretty. That's that's right. Thanks, Ira. And okay. trade the market that's in front of you. One okay. macro level to a t at a time. Thank you. Again, okay. thanks so much, Ira. And look and listen for comments coming out that may reverse this. Because don't forget, there's you know, nobody wants to see the world in this state. So, you know, maybe some uh, sense will be brought to the table. Well, especially fearless leaders. So you can have anything happen overnight. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and, and there's also, let me give you one more. There's uh, an, an Ambrose Evan Pritchard piece from yesterday. Uh, Germany mulls ban on negative rates for savers as irritation mounts over ECB's extreme policies. So there's pushback, and we have to be aware of the pushback, because if you get pushback, the world becomes a different place. And, and, and again, the central banks, the fingers point to the central banks. Always. Yep. And, and there goes the price of gold, as we, talk, yep. as we yeah. just you know, mentioned well, that. It's okay. All right. All right, guys. Good luck. Thanks, okay. Ira. All right. All right. So just a couple of comments just on the technical stuff, guys. When you get to a big macro level, like in the S&Ps, that Matt just took some profits in, you're going to get, at the same time, you're going to see that you're going to get extended in the gold, the silver, everything else. So these trades aren't independent. They're all kind of the same. So what you have to do now, depending upon how you've um, art articulated the trade, whether it was options, you're wearing them. If you're futures, you can manage them. But manage them, you should. And Pax, you can finish up and you guys can have at it. Well, I mean, you know, that, that, that just goes exactly to what we were talking about as as you had mentioned here, by the way, I'm dropping in that article uh, that Judd had talked about. I mean, not Judd, but Ira had talked about um, Germany and uproar as negative rates threaten um, saving obsession. Uh, understanding these points, uh, you know, what do you guys? How many? I wonder how many people you know dropped off while while um, Ira was talking about the macro. You know, what what does a macro? And I asked this question myself a million times as 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 I'm making a fortune on the trading floor. You know, but um, uh, I suppose it wasn't until no, it was during that time. It was after it was after uh, uh, Greenspan cut interest rates by fifty basis points. A story I told on Credelli's TV sh uh, podcast. When when Greenspan cut interest rates by fifty basis points, so I'd lost over a million dollars that day. Um, a million dollars that four years prior to that I didn't have. I had it because I listened to Judd. I learned how to trade um, the way that Judd, Judd told me the day that I met him, I'll teach you a process of trading that will work any time in the world at any market, any market in the world, any time, any place, on the floor, off the floor. I was like, yeah, okay, I'm in. You know, so anyway, that's how I was able to take that loss and keep on ticking. The point was is that I didn't even think up until that point that I needed to learn about what uh, the macro issues, and then therefore the capital flow from from in and out of different uh, asset classes to to you know the the stock rotation inside or the rotation of inside one class asset class. What that meant to me as a as a trader. Well, I after I after I saw something that almost uh, or could have uh, destroyed my career happened to me very quickly, I decided that I better get a plan and I better figure out what was going on. And instead of sitting there listening to these guys talk and pretend I'm listening and yawn and, you know, look at my clock wondering when, when I, can I get, can I, you know, I was looking to go run five miles on the lake. I'm looking to go grab a smoke and have a little Sambuca in the afternoon. And yeah, I started to listen. I started to pay attention. And that's when I started to really become, that's when I became a real trader. You know, I still did what I did before. But now I started to, to, to have to be able to understand and ask those questions. So I'm lucky in our room all, we, all day long, you know, in, in my room, we've got everybody that's learning how to trade a, a, a system, a process that I learned how to trade uh, primarily under Judd. And then I, I had, um, had kind of made it my own after MF failed and, and, and I was forced to, to start doing things quieter and slower and uh, uh, 
you know, and I and I devise the rest of the system on my own. To to the day where Judd and I are are working together, you know, separately but together, and and I get to ask questions of guys like Angelo, who you guys listened to speak five minutes ago, and and hopefully is still here, and Peter, you know, guys who understand the macro level and understand the macro the macro stuff way better than any of us do because it's it's partly their job to where it's our job to act on it and how do we do that well we have to we have to take action if we don't take action we don't make money if we are not involved in the market we do not make money and do you make money in trading s and p's by selling 24 halves and buying 24 evens yeah you make a half a point but is that a way to make a living you know, you want to trade. You want to trade like the big boys. You want to sell twenty fours and twenty eight twenty fours and and buy back twenty seven twenty fours. Not quite as simple as just throwing a ten lot on and putting a stop in and wait until it gets there. Anyway, and and you have to you have to listen because I mean it was just something that Ira said. We were looking for the timing and we thought it was going to be Monday and it was just something he said at the end of the conversation. It was just like okay. You know, it's time to put some 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 short exposure on and get longer the metals. It was as simple as that. But you know, we're kind of trained to hear that now. Uh, and, you know, after 40, 45 years for me, and Pax has been doing this an awful long time, and he's he's paid attention. And these conversations keep you trading from a side, keep you in the flow of the market and have you looking for opportunity from the right side of the market. And then our technicals get us in at the right level. You know, instead of spending time on the weekends listening to the Cub game or watching the Cub game, which I do, you know, I, I do spend some time though uh, um, reading uh, Ambrose Pritchard. I do spend some time looking over Danielle DiMartino Booth, uh, Peter Brookvar, you know, every time that I, re hey, as you guys who follow me on Twitter know, every time I repost a, a new blog post, I put that up there. Um, you know, uh, Angelo, Peter, who do you guys look to? Who do you follow? You know, those are the things that are important. You know, it, it's, it's to understand these issues, but then how do we funnel that back into our personal training, uh, trading, not training, trading? How do we, funnel all of those those macro big issues back in, in into our into our screens and those are the that those are the things that we've talked about a thousand times a million times that we need to continue to hash out and matt let me let me say one other thing too which is related and that is during periods of prosperity and we've had two and a half years up until september 30th of, of growth accelerating. And then prior to that, you know, going back to 2008 as well, some ups and downs, but generally up. The thing is, the central banks have been doing all of this stuff throughout this time period. But the shit or, or the warts, let me call them the warts, always bubble to the surface when growth starts to decelerate. Okay. When during periods of prosperity, the markets ignore it because profits paper over everything. Now that works in reverse. So all the bad shit, you know, starts to bubble to the surface. So now what do we got? We've got Trump. We've got central banks. We've got growth decelerating. We've got, you know, issues with China. All right. And I'm going to say it again, that consensus is way underestimating the risk with a China trade war, way underestimating the risk. You've been saying because that a long time. I, I'm, I'm going to say it again. I do not believe we're going to get one anytime between now and the 2020 elections. So and how do fact, you think that, Angel, how fact, do you, think that you notice, you notice, um, you know, Trump's pivot on Friday and over the weekend. All right. He's going to continue to twist corporate America's arm to get the hell out of China. So what I'm going to keep an eye out for are signs of, you know, the first major U.S. corporations that decide they're going to throw in the towel because they went in completely naive, thinking that they were going to have unfettered access to, to 1.2 billion consumers. And that's not what they got. 
and they gave up their intellectual property, their partnerships, all sorts of stuff. And that, you know, again, they should have known better. They were dealing with, with communists. Okay. And, you know, they need to get out of there and make their stuff somewhere else. So I'm going to watch for signs of that, of major companies saying, okay, you know what? We, we need to get the hell out of here. It's not worth it. Hmm. But the underpricing of risk due to a trade deal not happening, I still think, I think that's pretty huge. I mean, I, I think that's worth the Christmas lows. That, that, well, that'd be it. That, <laughs> yeah, I think you're, I think you're, I, I really agree. Okay. With you. I, I think that could be worth, you know, in, in combination. See, <laughs> growth is, the thing is, growth is decelerating. Okay. But if all of this geopolitical stuff ends up making it worse at the margin, right, then this sort of soft landing that I thought we would end up with could literally just end up into a, you know, a, a, a recession or maybe a little bit harder recession than anybody thought was possible. Okay. There's, so, your, Christmas, there, there, there's your Christmas lows easily. But okay. Easily, but beyond. Right. Right. And maybe, maybe, maybe beyond. beyond. Yeah, November. I've got. I I think that will break Christmas, and I want to hear what Judd says. But uh, break those Christmas lows and bring us back down to November. Was it November sixteen? You know, election time. Yes. Twenty one. Right, so here's two things. One, you got to take it one level at a time because yeah. this is not going to die an easy death. No. no, it's not. And the quarterly right there shows you exactly where. All the macro stops are right there. It's everybody's bust the gut low. Right there. 27, 28, 75. It's another 100 points lower. Got that price imprinted in my mind. Now, and whether we can get there, we can't get there, you know, that's going to be a huge target for September because the shit will truly hit the fan if we get down there. And guys will just give up totally give up on their retirement plans, everything else plans. They'll just want out. So yeah. what we do is go from one level to the next. We're trying to figure out how we get from A to B. And the less, you know, it's nice to have these concept conceptual talks, but you still have to get from A to B. And That's a, exactly correct. Yeah, right. and that's all risk management, guys. Uh, it, it, the price action will always tell us. I, the price action is always going to tell us where the market's going to go and how the market's going to go. That just that's a, one of the first things I said to Ira when we started talking is, "Hey, thanks for you know, for, thanks for the conversations Thursday and Friday." I, I was already looking at you know, uh, to, Friday morning we were looking to, to to sell rallies to be short out of the opening range, but you know, everybody in our room made money on the upside first. We broke out of the opening range. We rallied 20 handles on the upside, and we took profit on the way up, and we scratched them, got short in the opening range on the downside. So we let price action dictate that trade. However, because of, we already, because of our conversations with Ira, uh, with Ira, and we knew what we were already looking for, and the key phrases and key words that we heard made it very easy for some of us, in my, for me and, and, and others of us in both rooms, to add to our positions as we cover as we broke through certain certain levels. So that's just on a on a on a on a daily scale, Jed. Wait until we start hitting and breaking through these these macro levels, which is why I had an order resting at twenty eight twelve to cover a little bit of my S and P's. You know, next you know it, it's only a matter of from the intraday targets like a ladder. You know, up well, down. We have the price sheet in front right. of us. And so then we, people we, that don't subscribe to the price sheet, you're short-sighted and myopic. So, oh, which brings me to another, to actually it does, it brings me to another point of making sure you mentioned it earlier. Ira mentioned it, and we briefly touched on it, but making sure that everybody's looking at the right information, looking at the right charts. That is such, that is so misunderstood. And I don't think that there are very many people that actually teach what are the right charts that people ought to be looking at? <laughs> Is it a five-minute daily 
or five minute five you know five minute daily five minute uh, a, uh daily continuation active continuation um well, me, i won't look at anything uh, i'll look at a 240 minute once in a while sometimes an hourly but generally i'm out way out yeah. but, but, you know, but, but you know what matt quite frankly all of the above right so, hey matt I, I wanted to know you know using these these different time frame charts and you know the scenario where we have the uh, you know downside follow through hitting a target in the uh, in this future session. I mean, what, what do you what, what what can you recommend over the next you know between now and the first few hours of trading on Monday morning? I I I'm not going. I won't initiate any more trades. I'm looking for twenty eight eleven to either hold or not, but I'm not going to initiate under any trades on on a um on an overnight basis. I I just don't initiate trades until regular trading hours. So I'm gonna wait until the market opens tomorrow morning at 8.30 Chicago time. And, and that just like when we were on the trading floor, you know, every single day, the market has, the market has a few things in common every single day. And it hasn't changed just because you're trading on the, on, on, on the computer. But every morning we have an open, we have an opening range, then we have a closing range, we have a clo close. Um, the, the, the closing range is the last 30 seconds, first 30 seconds is the opening range. That's always been the way it was, and it always will be. And algos have been designed, many of them have been designed to make their breakout or try their breakout from the opening range. So, Peter, I'm going to wait. I'm already short from from twenty eight from 2908 from, from Friday's opening range. 2904 actually was the bottom. So, uh, no, 24, 20, uh, 2908 was the bottom, 2804 was our pay line. So, um, tomorrow morning... I'm going to look at the, the first 30 seconds and, and whichever way we break out is, is which way I'll be looking to trade. That's there. Otherwise, you know, that goes back to, to, to what Judd taught me in the beginning of my career is don't sell weakness and don't buy strength. Now, most people know that don't buy weakness, don't buy strength. They However, don't understand the concept. No, tell, tell that to the hedge funds, uh, Matt. I was just, I was going to, yeah, you're absolutely right. Most people know that, but most people don't do it because most people don't understand the concept. <laughs> exactly right. You know, and it goes back to looking at this, the right charts. And Angelo, unfortunately, your answer is absolutely right. All of the above, but most people don't understand that. I didn't. You know, I sat in there my very first class with the great technical, uh, technical analyst and, and teacher, Dan Gramza, when I first took a, a TA class with him. I was. I sat there with my mouth open. I, you know, like he, he may have been speaking in Greek. I, oh my God! What? Holy shit! What, what have I got myself into? What's this guy saying? But then he is. He said. He said something that struck me, uh, um, and I, I'll never forget it. Every trade that we put on has the potential to make our finan wildest financial dreams come true, and every trade that we put on has the, the potential to, to ruin us financially. Then I stood up, my ears perked up, and I thought, well, I better listen, I better figure out what this, uh, this, this, this stuff he's talking about is. Yeah, and, and here's, and here's a, a good example of, of strength, okay? We knew that 1538 to 40 was the breakout in the goal. So the low tick is 4540 and it goes straight out of the opening range straight up, you know, 12 bucks. Well, you know, or almost 20 bucks. So if you want to take that trade out of the opening range on a Sunday night, you know, have at it. But you're wrong down here. Well, that's a good point. You know, but again, once the S&Ps hit their number, this stop rallying. So now you got to wait till the morning to see what it's going to do. And that's why at, at this point, you shouldn't be clicking the mouse. All you should be doing no. if you have positions is, is protecting your positions. But let me make a quick point is, um, and, and everybody in our room, everybody in my room knows, um, everybody, the opening print in gold tonight is 15.45.4. What's the low of the opening? Yep. It's 15.45. Uh, 45 for the so the low and the opening print are the same what's that mean that's a very bullish signal until they take out that 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 level so i mean it's just something when you brought up gold it brings it 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 made me think of that peter i'm sorry you're going to say something and i just talked uh no i just wanted to say that <clears throat> that was that was a really good insight judd that it, it's the, the gold stopped that when the s p hit that target number 
Yeah. And, and I'll stand by it in the morning, see what happens. Yeah. That's right. That's I, I, I'm, I'm trading this like, this is a huge breakout. What's going on here with gold? And so I'm, I'm, I'm looking to, to, and I, and I'm going in very long tonight. I went in very long, <laughs> but, but I am looking over the next days and weeks for that to, you know, extend further. So I'll be looking for, you know, take some profits and re-enter and, and, and I'm going to try to make some very serious money on this move. Yeah. And you got to be careful because you know that these guys are scared shitless looking at the price of all, all of everything they've said today. And they're going to say stuff overnight and you can get reversals. So you have to be really cautious about what you're doing. The board is about playing the match game. And one instrument uh -huh. isn't going to move by itself. They all move in harmony. And when you learn to see that, you'll learn to trade better. They're, they're, they're different sides of the same coin. Yeah, there's just different sides. You can play them in a million different ways. But you know, if you don't if you don't want to be short the S and P's, you could have been long the bonds or the gold. You know, you can trade it different ways. They're all this, you're, you're right, Angela. It's different sides of the same coin, and it's how you want to trade it and what your comfort, your personal comfort level is. Yeah. There's there's a million you know, ways. You know, one, go ahead. I, no, I was, was going to say, um, you know, sometimes we tend to get caught up in the oh, shit, I missed this, I missed that. You know what? You don't have to catch every single trade. As long as you've got something on that properly expresses uh, your view, right? And, and gold certainly is in a bull market. And once I understood um, China, and once I realized there isn't going to be a trade deal on any breaks, I don't care how small they are. I've been nibbling and building a position. All right, but here, so that's a great point, Angelo, and that, um, uh, and that's there, that's where the macro the macro view comes into play. Yes, and that's why it's so important. Now we need. There are a million ways to make money trading futures, intraday, daily, whatever, all those other things. But there's a and there's a lot of ways of trading the story and, and we talk about that a lot the, the capital flow the other day we're watching we're all long we're all long nasdaq s p we watched the bonds explode we watched the gold explode and we all got out of our s p's and our uh, and our and got short pretty quickly in nasdaq but you know Ange, we so well said we always have to so you're nibbling we have to start we if we have a, if we have a, uh, an idea, if we have the, of, uh, if we have an idea of where the market's going, we know what the, or we at least we have an idea of what the, the price action and and the capital flow is starting to tell us. Then we have to have something on. Now, for independent smaller locals and, and independent well locals is, are what we call them called us independent traders on the trading floor, not retail traders but locals. So independent traders like like most of us, you know, don't don't carry positions, and if you do. You know, the guys in my room are learning how to carry positions with little to no risk after um, at least to the beginning capital of the trade, obviously. You know, we're protecting our trades. So there's always risk. You, but you, your you know strategy, I mean. Matt, your opening range strategy is an excellent strategy for people that don't understand global macro, okay, but then start to learn global macro, okay, and that's when they can really get dangerous. That's exactly – that's exactly right, Angelo. That's the point that I was trying to make is how do we get to the point where Angelo is, where we have where we have the macro story on? We have to start trading one lots and two lots and learning this process so that by you by the time you've been trading a few months and you've gotten confident not just in this process, but more importantly in yourself and you learn positive positive habits. Now you trade intraday with an eye on longer term positions. These shorts that I'm on, I'm not going to cover these shorts, the last part of them, until I'm, I, I scratch them. So I've got no risk on these shorts anymore because I'm either going to scratch what I have left or I'm going to buy them much, much lower. So as, as traders like Peter and, and Angelo, you know, longer term uh, macro guys are starting to nibble, 
we're letting the price action tell us when to get short and then managing those trades. And there's, like Jed said, millions of ways of doing that. We found ours. It works for us. Marlene asked a question earlier, just real quick, Marlene. I used the first, as we did on the trading floor and as they have for hundreds of years. It, 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 Ira and uh, Judd and I went back with Ira and talked about it and they can only identify traders going back into the 50s that did it uh, because, well, because of our, of our age. But the opening range is defined as the first 30 seconds of um, the, the, the regular trading hours trade. Or just, you know, if there is no regular trading hours like Globex where you open, just use the opening print. Yep. Now, getting back to studying and learning the global macro yes. and go out on let's let, let's finish her th her thought the problem you're having is that you're not looking at a long enough time frame chart and you're in a five minute two second a half a second i don't know what chart you're in but if you start looking at a daily weekly monthly yearly quarterly charts you'll see where the stops are the real stops and you'll use those stop levels to make trading decisions. So, so here, if we came down and we ran these stops and started coming back up, one, you wouldn't want to be short, and two, you'd want to be long. So you have to learn to use the charts to your advantage instead of getting twitted out by some twit head. <laughs> you know, you have to use, you have to use, broaden your time horizon out when you're looking at the stuff so you can see something. And right now, just by that, just by your, 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 your comments, you're not set up to see anything. And another, another point too, that's, that's, I don't see talked about very often in the Twitter sphere is money stops versus uh, uh, market stops. In our room, we don't use money stops. We don't, we're not going to, I'm not going to risk, I'm going to risk 2% of my account on this trade. Now, we, we, we don't put on trades unless we, we have three requirements filled. One is we have good trade definition or perfect trade definition. I'm not going to get into too much of that, but we have to know where the market is telling us that we're wrong first. And I don't know that you're doing that. So where is the market telling me if I'm wrong, if I'm long or if I'm short at a particular point, where is the market telling me that I'm wrong? Not my money, not my PL, not my statement, but where's the market telling me that I'm wrong? Okay, if I can't answer that by by the by the price action, then I can't put the trade on. I, I have no business putting the trade on unless I know where the market's telling me I'm wrong. So for for the sake of argument, if I get short at 2827, where does that make me? Where am I long? It, it, so if I, I sell them at 2827, it's a money stop would be I'm I'm wrong at 31, but I don't want to I don't want to stop out unless I get to a place that I would reverse. So that's how I define my trades. That keeps me from making trades at 26 and a half because I have a thought, I have an idea. No, I wait until I have actual trade definition. I know where the market's telling me that I'm wrong because. And, well, Pax has got a hard number down here. He took money, and you know what? This is the thinnest as part of the, 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 the whole next 12 hour cycle. Nobody's trading now. It's all algorithms reacting and he used the opportunity to, to lighten his risk and take money off the table. We could be anywhere in the morning. We could be higher in the morning. We could be lower than we are now in the morning. Who knows? But the point is, is you trade. He keeps trading to make money and to try to leave some runners on for a bigger move. It, it, that, and that, that, that concept applies to whether or not you're a short-term trader or whether you're an RIA with a longer-term time frame like myself. I always know where my exit is. It's usually at one of Judd's matrix levels, usually, okay? Or it might be some other number if appropriate. Oh, I <laughs> okay. Let me ask, but let me, let me okay, that so up. so it, it all goes to you know what's your risk profile? What kind of a an investor or trader are you? But always, always, always know where you're wrong. Yeah, so right, if so you're longer term, you maybe maybe where you're wrong is a little bit more in the way of wiggle room, but it better be at some important number. 
right, so here's my follow-up question, Ange. So if we're using, because I'm doing the same thing with Judd's tip matrix. All right, so if you're putting on, all right, let's just use the, and we don't have to use prices, but let's just say the Russell short you had, um, which worked quite well, but I, I might add. But all right, let's just say that. So um, you're putting them on at, at the matrix level. Is your stop at a place that you would at least consider getting long? Because we're, you're, you're so patient that you're not going to do anything in the middle of anywhere until the market gets to our matrix, to Judd's matrix levels that we both have and are using. So you sell them there, you know, and we know that above that, we're wrong. Would that be a place that you would think about getting along? And that, uh, the only reason I'm asking is because that, that's how I define my stops. No, it, it, no, no, because I have a negative view of the market. So okay. I give it a little. I give it a little bit more wiggle room. I, I may go short at a matrix level, okay, and and it may go three, four, five, six, seven points beyond that, and and it, it happens to me all the time. But that doesn't shake me out because I have a pretty firm grasp of of what the primary trend is. Mm. Using using now, now if I if we get to another matrix level. And I haven't stopped myself out yet. You know, I, I might wait for that next matrix level. You know, I might. It all. It, it just. It depends on what's going on at the time. It depends. That's always the answer. Is it? <laughs> and it depends upon how far. You know, number. Is. Um, like somebody when when Ira when we were still talking with Ira, I don't remember who it was, but somebody when we talked about getting down. I'm scrolling to find who it was. Um, when I said we could get back down to the Christmas lows of X, Y, and Z happened, mm -hmm. and someone mm -hmm. put in the chat, they said, um, oh, that would probably be a buying opportunity. And my answer to that oh, is, oh, who the hell knows? Yeah, I, I'm waiting okay. for that. Um, I, don't, I don't remember, you know, I'm, I'm looking to see who, who it was. Yeah, it was oh, it was, it was Paulie. It, it was every number all the way down. It was Paulie. Be really careful. Yeah. All right. It, it was it was Paulie that that uh, you know said that, and and my my answer to that is you don't know, it, it, because it might seem real cheap as of right now as we sit here and talk about it. Okay, but if we get there, you know you have to reassess because what if the data got worse? What if China dug in their heels and got even more belligerent and raised tariffs? You, you, you're going to buy the S&Ps down there just because three months prior, they, they say it seemed like it would have been like a great spot to get in. You can't do that. You can't presuppose what you're going to do. Because, you can think about it. Because the okay? answer is it all depends. It always depends. You're right. You don't know. You have to be careful. But like Judge right. said, one level at a time. Because yeah. maybe, we maybe we don't even get there. Who the hell knows? Well, this is all good stuff, guys. And what I would say to people that haven't been in my room or Pags's room or have come in and you're just listening, you should give it at least come in for a trial and you know see what we're doing. You know it'll give you another look on your trading and hopefully you know what we try to do is give you low risk opportunities. You know we we. Especially me, I'm not saying we're going here, we're going there. I mean, I always tell Paulie, you know, everybody, everybody's got an opinion. Well, great. Well, let's figure out how it's moving from A to B. And then let's make some money on that move. Opinions are great, but let the market begin to signal to you that you're right or wrong. Ah, you guys, you guys are familiar with that from my room, isn't it? And even or people that on Twitter, let the price action tell us. We all have opinions. If I, if I traded my no, it, opinion, it's not, yeah, it's not for me. Hey, hey Judd, if you don't mind, I, I have a, a theoretical question for Matt. Okay, go ahead. Then, then I got to, then I got to wrap it up because I'm, I'm. All right. Well, you don't, you don't have to say anything. But anyway, okay. um, so Matt, I, I was thinking, um, and and I'm, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to the question, but I, I want to hear how you answer it. Let's make believe that the pit goes away. Okay. Just like the Russell, there isn't one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then, it w without the eight thirty in the morning, uh, quote unquote, pit open because it no longer exists, and you don't have that. What do you then use? I would how, use how would you adjust your 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 methodology? There, well, it's, still, it's still the New York Stock Exchange opening, Angelo. 
So, yeah, but, yeah. So the the, the question well, is. Well, I, I again, I, I thought I I knew the answer to the question, but I wanted to hear what what well, Matt had to you know, say it's, about it. It's when they, it, you know, if they go twenty four hour trading of stocks worldwide, then you're not going to have an actual opening anymore. Not going to have it right. Yeah, you but, just won't have the you just won't have the what is it the EP anymore? What's no, what do you'll mean? have it, but it, it you won't have the the SPU pit opening. What they'll do is you know because it, it it it's pegged to the eight thirty opening of stocks. If stocks go virtual trading twenty four hours a day, which I think will drive most of these companies up the wall, and they wouldn't do it. <laughs> you know, then it's just futures, you know, 23 and a half hours a day. Everything. Well, so but, but so I, that, I said to myself, I bet the adjustment that, that Matt would make yeah. is just, just to use the futures trading, uh, you know, the first 30 seconds of uh, the New York Open, the, no, the cash well, open. Okay, well, yes, and we would. Absolutely use the, the, the it, if there was, a, if there's a New York Open, we're always going to use that. We're going to use the cash open. I don't, you know, the way that we calculate the, the pit opening is by using the, the minis and the first 30 seconds of the minis, and that just becomes their opening range. But for example, crude and gold, we use, I don't, we use the opening range in gold. I don't trade the opening range in gold. I don't use the opening range as a way to initiate trades in gold. I use Judd's matrix levels to initiate all my gold I, I found that gold is, and anybody in my room knows, I found gold is too difficult of an opening range trade. Crude works all the time. You, you just want to trade one market, make a lot of money, crude. Uh, you know, th th I don't think there is a pit for crude anymore, is there? That's been closed a long time too, but it, it's we still use the eight o'clock open because that's when, that's when the bots are turned on. You know, I want to make that's the highest- the volume comes in. Right, okay. I want to make the highest probability- I wanted to make the highest probability trades that I possibly can, which means that, and that's the third part of our, uh, our requirement is time frames, where the, the, the highest time frames are. And if you take a look at a chart at 759 Central, the volume is nothing. You take a look at 8 o'clock Central and gold kicks off. That's still considered the open, even though there's no pit. Yep. So okay. if we go I kind of had a feeling that would be your answer. Yeah, now, now listen, too, here on the other hand, on, on a Sunday night, you know, uh, not so much. And on a, re, on a reopen, uh, five, five o'clock central, six o'clock uh, night reopen, a Globex open, I'm not going to use 30 seconds for that. I'm just going to use the opening print. And so I'm going to use the opening print as sort of a 50-yard line. That changes the way that I manage positions because there is no algo. The, the, the four points that we use to cover are the first part of our trade in order to remove our risk so that the rest of our the rest of our two, either two thirds or three fourths of our position is now free or, or risk free because we've we've taken four points of risk, which in the S and P, which is what the algos are looking for, it's ten points in the Nasdaq. And if you look at the if if you look at the the crude, it's twenty cents. The first twenty cents of the breakout of the opening range is how we pay for our trades in in those tra in, in in those prospective markets. Four points in the spoos, ten and 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 it's four in the Russell. And I think it's 10 or 20 in the Dow. I don't, I don't trade Dow. You'd have to ask one of the other guys hit too. But anyway, we pay for our trades. And then that way we, we remove our risk and we can let the market, we let the algos take us where the algos are going to take us. You know, there's different things with, with the intraday targets that I have coupled with Judd's matrix levels that, that you know, the, the, the way that I trade is designed for two things, to take advantage of the entire day's range. And I mean, and you can ask the people in this room. And if we don't do that, then somebody here publicly say that doesn't happen. But we take advantage of the days, our targets take advantage of the entire day's range. Then the last part is designed to take advantage of the trend, of the wider trend. And that's how we use, that's how I use Judd's matrix level. <laughs> I can hold trades longer. I will hold trades longer. I'll add at certain places um, along the way. I need those. I need those. Uh, Rad, uh, Jack, Jack Dapp can answer that question for you. I don't trade. I haven't traded the Euro Open, um, the London Open, for a long time. And and, and you got to be careful with the Euro because there's a lot of wiggle in the in the currencies. So sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. And you know they haven't. You know, and you you have to be willing to give the 
the Euros more wiggle. Yeah, Euros, I, I, I'm not a big... It's a re- currencies are a really hard trade because it's all algorithms, it's all bots, it's a lot of retail guys, and it's the banks throwing up a bunch of bullshit quotes, and, you know, you're trying to figure out what's real. So, you know, in the trade currencies, you have to look at the, the currency crosses. You can't look at the, you, know, you just can't look at the euro. You got to look at euro Aussie, euro yen, euro CAD. You got to look at them, you know, euro pound. You got to look at them all, euro Swiss, and see which one's running the show. I mean, you just don't go, I'm going to buy euro or I'm going to sell euro. You better, you better know what's going on with every single cross. Or you shouldn't even be bothered. You shouldn't even trade it. You have no business trading it unless you're doing your homework on it. Because if you are, you're gambling. So I do not gamble and I don't trade euros because I I, I don't know enough to trade euros. I, I'm not euros, currencies. I don't know enough. I'm not a good currency trader. I know that. I don't do enough homework. I don't have enough time for it. And frankly, I'm more interested in other markets than I am currencies. And, and I, I, I use, I, I started trading currencies when there are blackboards in 1974. I mean, I don't have time to do the work and the currencies, you know, I look at them and I have alerts on them and I use them as risk on risk off. And I might uh, use them as a surrogate, something else as a surrogate to trade them. But you know, it takes too much attention for me right now and they've been relatively range bound for me to get involved. And Angela is the one that's made a fortune in the Euro this year, in the last year and a half. Mm-hmm. So, yep. you know, sometimes you can trade them and a lot of times you're just better off leaving them alone because they're easier things to trade. And we're always looking for the easier trades. At least I am. Friday morning, all I said was buy silver, buy gold. Buy the silver miners, buy the gold miners, buy whatever the hell you want, but that's going to be the trade. And right I now, t- we're up I haven't touched the euro in a couple of months. I said that. What? I haven't touched the euro in probably two, three months. Yeah. And, and right now, the gold's up $50 since I, when I started hawking it Friday morning. So. Oh, God. <clears throat> No, I, 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 the way that I screwed up that gold trade, even Friday I screwed it up. You know, look, look, the, the one thing that you, the, the one thing you'll always get out of Judd, the one thing that I've always gotten out of Judd was complete and utter honesty. Sometimes just too naked. I would rather have it a little bit clothed, but he is he's very direct, direct and bold, and there is no bullshit with him. And I mean, I, I, I paid him when I first started trading. I, I hadn't brought home money at all for my trading account. And he said, you're going to pay me a thousand dollars a month, um, but you're going to learn how to trade. A thousand, what, 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 a week. What, 200, yeah, a week, but I got $250 in my account. Yeah. Well, you pay me at the end of the week. And I did, I did. Yeah. Money didn't, you know, appear in my, I had to learn how to trust. First I had to trust him. I had to trust Judd before I can trust myself. He actually made the first two trades for me in a yellow coat. Hey, he just bought one from you. Yeah, but but he bet a thousand bucks on you that week, and you only had two fifty. So that was- <laughs> <laughs> I never looked at it that way. I just figured ah, I'll walk away from that kid. Right? You know, fuck, I'll go find another one. But uh, you know, I I never thought of it that way. No, we certainly, you know, I mean, of course. But I want to get back to that euro trade real quick. Uh, and I and I did want to. I do want to ask you about that Euro trade, Angelo. What was it? Are you, how do you do your homework with the currencies? Well, he's looking at the matrix level. First of all, he's got a Google map. I I had, I I always had a a view on, always had a view on Europe, watching the data and then putting the trade on at a matrix level. We get a little rally in the, in the Euro to a matrix level. That's where I'd put on the short. Not trading in between. Not trading in between. Uh-huh. Only looking at the big numbers, the hard numbers that are on the sheets, and not trading any place oh, else. That, right, I'll, I'll tell you what. The one, I, I, what I have noticed, 
Uh, let, Matt, me, let, let, let me make this point real quick first, though, because this is something that everybody struggles with. Every trader does. So, all right, uh, I'm sorry, Angela. I just really have to make this. So what Judd and Angela are talking about is not trading in the middle. And, guys, I mean, that, that, that's months and months. You know, he, he's talking about a huge move in, in euro, in the, in the currency. He's not trading. Every single one of us is having difficulty, not every single one of us, but every new trader is having difficulty not trading in the middle during the day, Angelo. So if we've got an interday target of 28, you know, if we trade 28.11, we're going to head back up to 28.44, right? Okay. I mean, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm just saying that that's a level up. And so, you know, traders, <laughs> traders, you know, independent traders, retail traders that are learning how to trade during the day are, are, you know, they may have those, those levels, but they're going to make 15, 20 trades in the middle of all of that. There's a term for it called FOMO. I didn't know that FOMO until I started tweeting, but fear of missing out. Everybody's, and you said this earlier, don't be afraid of missing the move, but you were talking about macro. You have to, uh, what I want to get across is that everybody, uh, you know, everybody has a hard time while they're learning how to trade to even just let the market trade the, the, the intraday targets and staying out of, of the chop and staying out of all of the garbage. That is why 95% of traders fail is because they can't just trade the levels. They never learn how to let the market price action tell them what to do. They're only, they're, they're looking at, they're, they're, they're trading every point, every level and every little wiggle in between. And you can't, you can't. You can't no, start off with one thing, right? If you if you have guys that are new, you know, or newish, just trade the S and P's and nothing else. The funny you know, thing, start, you know, pay pay attention to what other things are doing so that you you can learn. Okay, but just stick to one market until you perfect that. That's maybe. so important. So important. And you know what it is too. Another thing, Ange, is that. It's not, for the most part, it's not always the, the newer traders. It seems that the newer traders in our, the newer traders in our room are some of the guys that are doing the best. And uh, uh, the reason that is because they haven't developed any bad habits and we're doing some one-on-one -on -one work. And so they're learning from me and they're doing very, very well. It's the traders who have been around a while, who have been from room to room, from one mentor to another mentor that have all of these different habits and and all of this knowledge built up in their mind and so they think that they need to catch every move they think if they don't that they're a terrible trader if they you know all yeah, kinds they got a trigger a two second trigger and they have to take it and they don't know what they're taking it for you know and, and i think it's interesting that that it's an inter it's a, it's an interesting way of looking at it from a macro level to the micro level from the macro level being days, weeks, months, even years out for you to the macro level of, I mean, the micro level of intraday trading from, from just one, one of my target levels from another, whether it's 10 points away or 20 points away and we've, we have, or 30 points away and we have them both. <laughs> it's, it's difficult to not trade in between, but once you learn how to do it, that's when you are going to put yourself in a spot of being a long time profitable trader. I mean, it's taken me five years of intensive study and, and, and whatnot to get to this point, you know, of, of trading a lot of different things at different mm -hmm. times, sometimes, you know, simultaneously, but mostly separately. But what I was going to say about currencies is what I've noticed is they tend to move from point A to point B the fastest. They tend to be a lot quicker about it. All right, so here's the thought. So with that, here's the thought of, of, of so many tra intraday traders is, is that they get whipsawed, so whipsawed in between that uh, they can't trade currencies. I'm done with it, you know? And, and I, I don't trade them only because there's, I'm more comfortable trading other, but you know what I mean? The, so it trades too quick. There's not enough in there, you know, which goes right to what you're saying. Trade the levels, trade the targets. That's it. Trade, trade the macro levels. That's all. You, 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 but you, you need to, um, for, for me, um, I like being short a lot on stuff. So, so when we're in negative markets, um, that suits my personality better. All right. I just like it. I just like it when shit goes down. I just have more fun at it. I, I don't know why. <laughs> Here, take, a, take a look at this euro. Okay. And this is why I don't trade it all the time. 
2016 and 17, everybody in the in their mother on mainstream media, we're going to par, we're going to 90, we're going to 80. Oh, I remember no, that. We're there, okay? My work said there was it was it was sold out. There was no more downside. And I had hard numbers. And it's like, there's no more downside. But it took almost two years to turn before it rallied. And again, 2017, in uh, September, the 1st of October, Iris, Iris Credelli asked Ira uh, a question about the euro. He said, I want to sell it at 125 and a half. I didn't see how it was going to get there from 110, but it went there. And that was a stone cold high. I remember that. So, you know, he does his homework. And a lot of times, especially the currencies, they take a long time to develop. So you have to be really patient with them. Yeah. It's not like, oh, I got to be in. I got to be in. You know how many times you could have bought the euro and, and, and been broke before it finally took off? I mean, Matt, I started buying. Uh, I started buying the dollar the first quarter of eighteen, and I, I sold it out uh, January of this year. Yeah, I mean, it takes a while for these things to develop. You know, and then along way, uh, along the way, I, I was, uh, you know, I shorted the the euro a couple of times, but at matrix levels. At matrix levels, that's that's the okay. key. So and and why, why did I short it? Because I knew that Europe was going to continue to have economic troubles. Or not new. I mean, that that was just my view. Both of, and both. Angelo. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to no. say Judd's matrix levels helped me both in my longer term position and, and trading it on the uh, ORB at a matrix level and then knowing when to pull them off. Yeah. So I was able to clear the table because I had been short for a year and a half, um, you know, entering what would be what would have been around matrix levels. And I knew when to clear the table because of it. So yeah, it does work. Yeah. You just got to be patient. I, I would. I only shorted from one matrix level to another. Then I'd cover, and then I'd wait and see what would happen. Let the board reset. Then the euro would rally, go back up to the same freaking matrix level. I'd short it again. And no, that's for, basically what, that's basically where I'm at with the Russell man. The Russell keeps doing the same damn thing. It does now here's the thing for for all of us. The way that so the way that Angelo trades obviously weeks months days weeks months years, that's the same. It's the same for us. That's why they call it macro micro. It's the same for us. It's just micro. We are doing the exact same thing every single day. Only what we're doing also has an eye on the macro. What if if it's a third of my position or if it's a quarter of my position, I leave that on for the macro breakout to the next uh, to the next matrix level. <laughs> while during the the micro or intraday trading we have our methodology of how we not only enter our trades but how we manage our trades so that we don't have any risk on our trades it's a free trade especially if it's a if this is a position that we're going to wind up taking for for you know overnight at least with an eye on t tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, you know, and I've had trades that have lasted that long that start with the first, uh, w with, by letting the algos do the work for me. You know, when I was on the floor, when we were on the trading floor and I was in the pit, it was my job to, um, it was my job to, it was my job to move the market. It was my job to paint the tape, especially as I became a big trader. So, if the opening range was, you know, like last week, 04 to 08 or 08 to, oh, I forget what it was, 08 to 10. Underneath 08, I'm short. You know, I know that I'm going to cover my position here, blah, blah, blah. But I had to sell the evens and the 99s and the 97s. And, you know, other traders did too. And we, work, we would work together and, and help one another out. But we had, to, we had to paint the tape. Now the algos do that. And everybody wants to fight the algos. Everybody wants to pick a high. Hey, I sold 53.43s in the crew today. I sold the high. Look how brilliant I am. I don't care about that. What I care about is how did I trade my plan that day? My plan is what's going to get me to where I need to go financially. So back to the micro. Now, I'm not trading in the middle. I'm trading at my targets. I'm initiating trades out of the opening range. So I sell them. I cover my trades the way that I cover because that's how the algos do it. And then I let the algos do the work. 
and I've taken profit at least twice before a position goes home with me overnight, and then I'll add to it the next day the same way, the same way, same way. So think about October, November, December, the size of the positions I had, and I didn't have any risk on them. At, at worst, you know, it was a scratch because I've taken position, or I took, I took profit two or three times at the minimum before I took it home. All the while having good intraday, you know, intraday profit. So trading is, is a lot of things. Like Judd said earlier, we could, there's a million ways to make money trading futures, but one way that you are trading the markets, one way that is, that's it, that is, in my opinion, common in every single trade is how you manage your position. If you do not know your second trade first, then you have no business putting on that trade. If you do not know where you are wrong, before you put on the trade, where the market's telling you you're wrong, not your P&L, but where the market is telling you that you're wrong, do not put it on, especially for micro intraday traders. If you, if you don't know where the market's telling you that you're wrong, being short, you don't know where the market's telling you being wrong, being long, don't put it on. Wait, be patient. You don't need to catch every move. It's better. Your, your job isn't to catch every move. Your job is to be here tomorrow so that the move that you see clearly, the big move, the one that you've been waiting for, you can get on. And you're not making up for lost time or lost money. You're just, you're just putting on, on the trade because it's not about tra – trading is never, never about time. It's not never about it, – it, it's about distance traveled, not time traveled. I'm looking to take money out of the market every day, little chunks of money out of the market every single day. I'm just letting the, 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 the it algos. Always, it's always distance traveled, not time in the trade. That's right. And I'm not trading to be right. You're make, trading to make money. All right, guys, this has been a great session. Pax, thanks. Yes, thank Everybody you, Everybody that's in. Good night, you know, guys. You, you know, we're, you know, Pax and I do this every day, all day long. Yep. So, um, you should come in, sign up, and learn. Absolutely, everybody. Thank you. Judd, thanks again. You know, uh, everybody get some rest. I think that these, these, uh, these next few days, these next few weeks are going to be incredibly interesting, very busy. Oh, it's yeah. going to be busy because, yeah. you know, uh, you know, we, we already talked about it and people aren't even looking at it. And it's the European bond rolls that are going to really set off the equity indices and people aren't even looking at that yet. All right. I gave all that to you guys. So please make sure you print that off. I can't, I told you on Friday, I can't express how, how important that is that you have that, that, um, that calendar next to you. So important. All right, guys. Thanks again. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Write down uh, my, my uh, 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 Judd, what's your? Uh, uh, www.whitewavetradingstrategies.com. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm get this that. rendered, I think Jack will send it out to everybody. Oh, yeah, that's right. Here I am trying and we'll, to be. And we'll tweet it out. All right, everybody, have a great night. Seriously, thank you for being here. Um, uh, uh, Chris Simp, stay short and, and long. Don't cover yet. Talk to you guys later. Okay. Adios.